Good afternoon. My name is Paul Ryder, and I am the Director of Scholar Programs at the School for Advanced Research. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Benjamin Jung, uh, who is a professor, a full professor. He's recently been promoted. Congratulations, Ben. Um, full professor of anthropology at the Department of Anthropology, SUNY New Paltz in New York. Um, Dr. Young earned his PhD from Emory University, Department of Anthropology in 2007. And he also holds a master's in health from Johns Hopkins University um, from the 1990s. Dr. Dr. Young is the author of Cynical Citizenship, Gender, Regionalism, and Political Subjectivity in Porto Alegre, Brazil, University of New Mexico Press 2018, and also uh, a number of articles um, and book chapters, but also the just published, uh, he's the co-editor, one of the co-editors of this just published book, uh, Precarious Democracy. This is a copy that Ben has donated to us here at the uh, SAR library, so please come check it out. Um, this book just, uh, just published by Rutgers is um, based on a short seminar that Ben was a co-leader for with Sean Mitchell here at SAR a few years ago, and we're thrilled to see how quickly uh, at this very timely work has come out. Um, while at SAR, uh, Dr. Young's project uh, that he'll be speaking about today is titled Political Subjectivities in Times of Crisis, Nostalgic Narratives of Disorder and Disinterest Among Working Class Families in Brazil. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Young. Thanks, Paul, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to share some of my research and writing plans for my fellowship period here at the School for Advanced Research. And I'm grateful to SAR for this amazing opportunity. I've been here in Santa Fe for a month now, and I'm really enjoying the majestic campus environment, uh, the time to focus fully on my scholarship, and getting to know the other residential scholars, from whom I'm sure I'll learn a lot in the months to come. Two quick shout outs before anything else. First, to my mother, Maxine, and my sister, Alexa, who've been super supportive of my work and my escape to Santa Fe. Mom and sis, it'll be great to show you around when you come to visit in a, a couple of months. Uh, also, a quick message to my Brazilian colleagues and friends. Saudações aos meus colegas e amigos brasileiros, especialmente a família da minha filhada Raquel em Porto Alegre e a família da Dona Vera em Recife. Tenho saudades de vocês todo, todas, todos e todes, e se as condições pandêmicas permitirem, espero voltar ao Brasil logo em seguida. Peço desculpas por o restante da minha apresentação ser em inglês. Dentro de alguns meses, terei uma tradução em português de um trabalho recente que realizei no Recife e prometo disponibilizar o mesmo amplamente. Ok, onwards. So, the plan for my presentation, uh, there are five pieces of it. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself and how I became interested in Brazil. Then I'm going to present the context, the national Brazilian context of my research. Then I'll tell you about that research project. And then I'll tell you about the book project that I'll be working on uh, during my stay uh, here in Santa Fe based on that research. And I'll wind down with some uncertainties and possible ideas that I'm entertaining uh, as I get ready uh, to write this book. So uh, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist with a regional focus on Latin America and Brazil specifically. My research focus is on civic participation and class mobility and how these are both influence, uh, excuse me, how these both influence and are influenced by gender, sexuality, race, religion, and geography. Um, I also had an earlier career uh, before becoming an anthropologist. I worked for uh, over a decade uh, in the field of public health as an epidemiologist working on HIV prevention uh, among people who use drugs in Baltimore. Brazil has been heavily in my life for more than two decades. 
And uh, basically, there have been two phases of, uh, of work that I've done in Brazil that correspond more or less with the first and the second decade of the uh, 21st century. Uh, the first part, part of that um, uh, was uh, all focused on the city of Porto Alegre, which is a large city in the deep south of Brazil. It's the capital of the southernmost state of Brazil. And during the, that period, Porto Alegre was, we could say, the darling of the Latin American left. Uh, there was a lot of very interesting experimentation and leftist participatory democracy happening there. And I took an interest and uh, did uh, a bunch of uh, different projects on that. Um, especially interested in uh, gender, religion, and regional uh, gaucho identity um, as it comes into play in civic participation in Porto Alegre. Those of you uh, who are familiar with the World Social Forum or participatory budgeting, it all began in Porto Alegre, and that's what my work was on in those years. Uh, one book came out of that. It's called Cynical Citizenship. Um, and, uh, and some other uh, subsequent uh, publications. More recently, over the last 10 years, um, I've switched my focus to another corner of this uh, very large country, um, which is the city of Recife, or Recife, and focusing primarily on class mobility, and you're going to hear more about that uh, uh, shortly. Um, uh, what I'm saying now, and this is sort of shameless uh, self-promotion, um, is that one publication so far, one big publication has come out of this. Uh, it's a book that just came out about, uh, since I've uh, been here in Santa Fe. Uh, it's an edited volume that I organized with some of my colleagues called Precarious Democracy, Ethnographies of Hope, Despair and Resistance in Brazil. And uh, if you're interested in what's going on in Brazil um, uh, over the past few years from an anthropological perspective, well, I heard it's a great, a great book and it's, a, it's not too expensive, it's good stocking stuffer. Enough for my uh, shameless plug. All right, so now I want to talk about the context, um, the national context for my research and the book project, um, of course, that I'll be working on. So. Around 2010, just a decade ago, Brazil seemed to be a country on the rise. With the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Summer Olympics secured, Brazil's international reputation as an emergent world power with firm democratic and economic foundations seemed assured. After decades of economic instability, the years following the 2002 election of President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, or Lula, of the leftist workers' party known as the PT, were characterized by economic growth and the massive reduction of poverty and inequality. During Lula's two terms in office and the first term of his PT successor, Dilma Rousseff, an estimated 35 million people rose above the poverty line. The emergence of this demographic sector, the so-called new middle class, was celebrated as evidence of Brazil's entrance onto the world stage as a modern nation. While there is some debate about who gets the credit for this extraordinary transformation, most agree that both macroeconomic factors, for example, rising Chinese demand for Brazilian exports, and government initiatives in the form of social welfare programs, increasing minimum wage, greater access to higher education, and the expansion of elderly pensions were all crucial. There is little doubt, however, that without the social welfare programs implemented under 14 years of Workers' Party rule, programs like the famous Bolsa Familia uh, Family Allowance Program, the world's largest conditional cash transfer program, uh, without these programs, the scale of poverty and inequality reduction would have been massively diminished. In this sense, then, Brazil's new middle class owes much of their mobility to the PT. The optimistic moment ended abruptly in 2013 when demonstrators protested increased bus fares, bloated expenditures on the World Cup and Olympic Games, and diminishing social support from the government. In 2014, greater numbers of protesters mobilized against corruption and called for President Rousseff's ouster. Incited by the conservative national media conglomerate Globo, uh, the protests were marked by expressions of rage against Lula, against Dilma, and against their party, the PT. 
By the time Dilma Rousseff was impeached in 2016, just five years ago, Brazil was facing the worst recession in 25 years. Meanwhile, unemployment and inflation were on the rise, and the former, and former excitement about Brazil's new middle class had more or less evaporated, as many members of this demographic group fell back below the poverty line. The reversal of fortune that I've described is the national context for my research and for the book project I'll be describing. And it's the so-called new middle class, a group which I now instead refer to as Brazil's once rising poor, that is the demographic sector that I'm interested in, that I work with. In 2018, some of you may already know this, Lula, the former PT uh, president, began a 12-year prison sentence after having been found guilty for corruption, though he was released in November of 2019. Uh, 2018, as you may know, was also the year uh, of uh, a victory um, for far-right presidential candidate Jair Bolsonaro, beating out his PT challenger. Bolsonaro's election betrayed a certain inadequacy in how scholars from the social sciences, and I count myself among them, have understood the political affinities of poor and working class people in Brazil. Taking seriously the, the, the effect of real and growing discontent over political corruption and violence on voting choices, many of us were nonetheless astonished that so many poor Brazilians would vote against a party that at least officially prioritizes the reduction of poverty and inequality in favor of a man who publicly questions whether de democracy is superior to dictatorship as a form of government and is homophobic, sexist, and racist to boot. My research doesn't seek to definitively answer this question. But it does aim to understand the precarious conditions under which a range of frustrations, anxieties, and dashed hopes might congeal into a vote for a populist, hard conservative outsider like Bolsonaro. I am, of course, aware that support for similar figures in other parts of the world has been on the rise in recent years. But to be clear, I'm not trying to explain the global spread of populist conservatism. And frankly, I tend to lean against assertions that Bolsonaro is the Trump of the tropics if those assertions detract from understanding the specificities of Brazil's story. All right, now I'm gonna tell you about the research project now that I've mapped out the context for you. So the conditions of economic and political crisis that I've just described are the backdrop for the research informing my book project. From 2016 to 2018, I was one of three principal investigators uh, on a project funded by the National Science Foundation's Cultural Anthropology Program to understand how experiences of socioeconomic mobility and precarity among Brazil's once rising poor impacted everyday life material conditions and how they influenced political views, class identifications, and cultural memory. More specifically, I also ask how the dashed hopes of once rising poor Brazilians influence their political values, attitudes, and behaviors, especially as they took shape in the months leading up to the 2018 elections. A couple of quick theoretical engagements. Um, uh, first, about dashed hopes, structures of affect accompanying these dashed hopes Brazilians seem to me reminiscent of the cruel optimism that queer theorist Lauren Berlant uh, associated uh, famously with late capitalism, whereby dreams of a better life and the sense, a sense of forward momentum erode as the social institutions that once offered up, upward mobility themselves fall apart. For previously ascendant Brazilians, the experience of a reversal of fortune, the capsizing of an earlier subjective sense that th things were getting better, has left a distinctive mark on political views, perhaps conferring its own variety of rage and resentment towards and alienation from progressive politics and democratic political institutions more generally. One other uh, quick theoretical uh, engagement. Uh, in recent years, interest in middle-classness 
both as an emergent so sociological demographic phenomenon and as a theoretical problem has grown within my field, anthropology, and more broadly in the social sciences. This uh, was reflected uh, in the important 2012 publications, two of them. Uh, one of them was uh, The Global Middle Classes Theorizing Through Ethnography, uh, edited by Rachel Heyman, Carla Freeman, and Mark Lichty. And I mention this because this was a book that came out of an SAR uh, research team seminar and was an SAR publication. So kudos to SAR um, for getting behind that. And uh, another 2012 um, very important book, The Making of the Middle Class Towards a Transnational History, edited by Ricardo Lopez and uh, Barbara Weinstein. Following the sensibility of these two volumes comparative case studies, I approach middle classness as a sociocultural formation with intertwining material, symbolic, and affective dimensions that can be productively studied through eth ethnographic attention to styles of consumption, forms of labor and production, experiences of urban space, and motiv motivations for civic participation. These different domains are frequently connected in middle class practices and subjectivities, and as Rachel Heyman writes, quote, are often imbued with affective traces of aspiration and anxiety and the desire for a feeling of security and belonging, unquote. Combining survey research methods with a range of ethnographic interviewing and observational techniques we conducted fieldwork in the three cities of Recife, Rio de Janeiro, and Sao Paulo. So for those of you familiar with Brazilian geography, uh, you may already know that Recife is uh, on the northeastern uh, coast of Brazil. Uh, that is the region that is historically uh, the least economically developed, the poorest region, and the most Afro-Brazilian region. The other two cities, Rio and Sao Paulo, are in the historically more developed and economically powerful southeastern region. Now in Rio de Janeiro, uh, my colleague Sean Mitchell from Rutgers University Newark coordinated field work for our project. Um, and in Sao Paulo, my colleague Charles Klein from Portland State University uh, coordinated uh, field work there. Um, as I said, this was a collaborative three city project. It also was a three year project. And in the first year, we conducted a structured household survey with approximately 400 respondents in each of the three cities. And in years two and three, we conducted a range of ethnographic studies to delve deeply into daily life experiences and emergent subjectivities, including using open-ended interviews with adult family members of different generations and key community figures such as business owners, neighborhood association leaders, church leaders, local activists and artists, and local elites. I'm happy to talk more about the methodology details during the question and answer part if anyone would like to. Before I get to the book, I want to make a comment about fieldwork. And I want to say that fieldwork is much more than just collecting data. So I've got a handful of pictures here that I want to uh, show you and reflect very briefly on. Um, so this is, these are all images from uh, the last substantive, um, almost a full year of field work that I did in Brazil in 2018. And uh, this is a, meant to give you a glimpse of like the actual you know, life of an anthropologist doing extended field work. And it involves not just collecting data, but packing up and as you can see in the first photo, uh, moving out of my house in Beacon, New York. Um, uh, hanging out with uh, dear old friends, uh, this is all in Hesifi, in the city of Hesifi, uh, watching the World Cup. Um, I, I was also teaching a class at the Federal University of Pernambuco in, in Hesifi, so you have an image there of me with my research method students. Uh, you have another image of two people sitting on a couch who are my excellent research assistants who help me make sense of uh, my interviews and observations and help transcribe the interviews. You also have an image of a large public event. Uh, this was a sort of a cultural political event in the weeks leading up to the elections in 2018. You have an image down in the lower left-hand corner of um, 
unnerving political propaganda that one encounters in public spaces, um, and as a, a, a foreign or gringo intellectual, occasionally I'm discovered and asked to, to grant an interview on the press, which I try not to do very much. But you have an image of me giving an interview to Telesur uh, in Quito, in uh, uh, Ecuador. Um, and finally, field work is also about escaping field work. And the final image is me the day before the, uh, the 2018 presidential elections when the whole country was very stressed and anxious, and this I found a few hours to escape it all and tune out reality a little bit. This is all part of anthropological fieldwork. All right. So several conference papers and publications have already come out of the grant and the research project that I've described for you. Some of these are quantitative and based on the survey data set. Others lean more towards a qualitative ethnographic sensibility. Some of these involve collaborative analysis and writing. Some of them are just me. As a whole, what we've done so far reveals a once rising poor that is economically precarious, doesn't invest in identification with popular class labels, least of all middle class, and is significantly alienated from formal politics. The book I'm writing here at SAR explores how the period leading up to the divisive 2018 elections was experienced by once rising poor families in the Hisifi uh, neighborhood where I resided during field work. A neighborhood I refer to, and it's a pseudonym, as Mojo Dosi, which in Portuguese means sweet hillside. Mojo Dosi is home to about 30,000 residents and situated about 45 minutes by bus from Recife's downtown centro, uh, center. Um, you have some uh, images, quick images of the neighborhood. Um, it's a hilly neighborhood. And you also have images in the lower, uh, an image in the lower right-hand corner of the slide of my research team uh, during that second year of, of field work, um, amazing colleagues who helped me out immensely. We're also being photobombed in the picture by the neighborhood uh, hairdresser, too. So a nice little touch there for you. So as its common thread, my book centers on the narratives of one extended family, a family I lived with during field work and refer to as the Pereiras. I came, uh, as I came to know the Pereiras, forging lasting friendships with the family's matriarch, Elena, uh, that's also a pseudonym, um, and the families of her four adult children, I gained access to an incredibly rich set of narratives that speak to the hopes and frustrations of millions of once rising poor Brazilian families in times of growth and crisis. My account of the Pereira family and other once rising poor families in the neighborhood from my ethnographic sample draws from my own field notes, from informal and structured interviews, and from observations, both face-to-face, in-person observations, and online, um, uh, in online social media. I first met the Pereiras in 2017 when I was introduced to Elena through a mutual friend from her neighborhood uh, who had worked for, uh, for me on the big survey I mentioned earlier the year before. I rented a room from Elena for a few months that year, and in 2018, when I returned to Hesifi for seven months to teach at the local university and complete project field work, I regularly visited the Pereiras to catch up on the family's comings and goings. Like many working class fam uh, Brazilian families, the Pereira family has thrived in recent years. After years below the poverty line, by 2018, the family's per capita household income rose, had risen to the category economists typically refer to as lower middle class. And the grandchildren had gotten into college through a federal affirmative action, uh, action program targeting poor and non-white applicants. Over the past two decades, their houses, and you can see, by the way, uh, their house, uh, excuse me, uh, their house, uh, it's the one on the right side with two women standing uh, out in front of the, uh, the garage there. Um, once it was a precarious hillside dwelling, but over the years it has been fortified into a safe and stable residence in which Elena and the families of her children occupy separate households connected by, maze, by maze-like hallways. The house sits on the neighborhood's main thoroughfare. The family's economic stability comes in large part due to the gainful employment of 
for most of Elena's children. Her oldest son, Gabriel, is a sergeant in the Brazilian army, giving him a robust salary that provides financial security for the family and has enabled the purchase of a humble country house a couple hours from Recife. Now I'd like to read you a short ethnographic narrative and, and give you some reflections that map out the terrain I intend to explore in the book. This is from uh, the evening of um, uh, September 17th uh, in 2018. Here we go. For a large family like the Pereiras, birthdays are frequent, and they come with the expectation of a party. So despite it being a busy weeknight, the extended family, a handful of neighborhood friends, and I uh, have assembled to commemorate Lucy Mar's 57th birthday. Her son, Carlinhos, shares some warm remarks about his mother. Quote, we decided to make the simple tribute to reciprocate the attention that Lucy Mar has for each of us, each one of us. Anyone close to her knows how sweet she is, how special, special she is, how dedicated and how hardworking she is, unquote. Lucy Mar, the birthday girl, is the daughter-in-law of the Pereira's matriarch, the woman I mentioned earlier, Elena, who is, 63, uh, who is a 63-year-old widow. And Elena seems to be content uh, at this event as she sits on the sofa and listens to her grandson, Carlinhos, speak. Elena has two sons and two daughters. Uh, and all of them are married adults in their 30s or 40s. Her sons, Gabriel, uh, who is the army sergeant I mentioned, uh, and Edgy Nielsen uh, are, are here tonight. They're at the birthday party. Um, her two daughters, Sonia and Katya, are not present. Sonia lives with her husband and daughter in a nearby city, but before the end of the evening, she'll send along birthday greetings on WhatsApp. Um, the other daughter, Katya, lives in Switzerland, where a few years back she married a Portuguese man and has recently had a daughter. The party foods, an enormous chocolate cake surrounded by platters of empadas with their savory aromas wafting through the room, are proving a distraction. And Carlinho soon wraps up the homage, the homage to his mother. Quote, we wish you good energies, health, protection, positive thoughts. We want you to enjoy every moment of your life with those who love you and respect you and cherish you. People who are part of your life, each one present here, unquote. Someone launches into happy birthday to you, and everyone sings and claps enthusiastically. Soon after, cake is served, and people sit around for the next hour or so, chatting, snapping photos and videos to post on Facebook or send on WhatsApp. Uh, the photo that Elena, the matriarch, posts, which I took at her request, shows the whole family flanking the birthday girl, Lucy Mar. I wasn't the only photographer in this moment, so the photo captures the family gazing in slightly different directions, leading one of Elena's Facebook friends to comment, quote, a familia está vesguinha, unquote, which can be translated as the family looks a little cross-eyed, you know, LOL. I'll come back to that in a minute. Despite the usual intergenerational tensions, sibling rivalries, and frictions with in-laws, the Pereiras, like most working class Brazilian families, manifest a powerful solidarity, supporting each other when times are tough and celebrating milestones like birthdays, weddings, baptisms, and graduations. Still, there was, a palp there was palpable tension in the air on this particular night as Lucy Mar's birthday fell just three weeks before the date set for Brazil's first round presidential election on October 7th. And anticipation of the election had introduced new anxieties into everyday life for the Pereira family. On this night, family members were indeed gazing in different directions, different directions for their own lives and for Brazil. These were the elections that saw the extraordinary rise and eventual triumph of hard right candidate Jair Bolsonaro, a former army captain and seven term congressman from Rio de Janeiro. Relying heavily on social media, Bolsonaro took a tough stance on crime and defended traditional family values, unquote. He promised austerity measures and cuts in government spending and vowed to stamp out crime and violence by providing 
greater access to firearms for ordinary citizens. The one family member openly supporting Bolsonaro, Elena's oldest son, Gabriel, had in recent weeks increasingly used his own Facebook page and the family's private WhatsApp group to praise his candidate and to argue the need to demolish the entire political establishment in Brazil. If asked about his support for Bolsonaro, uh, Gabriel would likely mention at least one of the following themes. First, the need for a president who owes nothing to nobody or anybody and would thus be singularly capable of bulldozing an irredeemably corrupt political system based on bribes. Next, the problem of violence in urban public, uh, public urban spaces and the promising solution of making gun ownership easier for the citizenry. Next, the critique of human rights discourses which exacerbates violence by giving undue uh, respect and legal protection to undeserving criminals. Next, the urgent need to reintroduce discipline, respect, and morality through a more structured vision of education. And finally, the need to keep the PT from ever assuming power again in Brazil. Gabriel, like Bolsonaro, often waxes nostalgic for the years of Brazil, Brazil's military dictatorship in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when he imagines life to have been less chaotic and safer, a time when children respected parents, students respected teachers, and criminal, criminals didn't receive special treatment. Particularly uncomfortable with Gabriel's support for Bolsonaro was his nephew, Everton, who is Elena's grandson. I know there are a lot of names here. Everton, the grandson, Elena's grandson, is gay. Though at the time of the elections, he was not out to his family. In private, however, the family regularly speculated about the sexuality of this beloved grandson. Gabriel, who at the time of the elections had no children of his own, was particularly anxious about the sexuality of his nephew, an anxiety that resonated with his concerns about the breakdown of morality and respect in Brazilian society and his ever-intensifying conviction that the lion's share of blame for this lay with Lula and the PT. At the time of his mother's birthday party, Everton was several months into his first ever relationship with a cla uh, classmate from his program at the university. And he felt a growing sense of disconnect between his out life, his vida sumida, on campus and the secrecy at home. I myself identify as gay, and by the elections, most of the family was aware of this, and perhaps offset by my status as an American uh, U.S. gringo with academic cr credentials seem to have little issue. Nonetheless, background tension grew as Everton became increasingly frustrated with his uncle's postings on Facebook and WhatsApp about the moral menace of homosexuality. For his part, Gabriel grappled with the growing disconnect between the long-standing affection between him and his nephew uh, and their intensifying discord online a disconnect that Gabriel perhaps linked to my own friendship with the family. There was some basis for this as I enjoyed a strong friendship with his mother, Elena, with his wife, Patricia, and with Everton, his nephew, whom I have always tried to support as he moves forward in constructing a new sexual identity. For other family members, anxiety around the elections was less about Bolsonaro than about a perceived destabilization of a more unified and more social family dynamic. Elena, the matriarch for her part, had grown irate with the politicization of the family's WhatsApp group, as did Luzi Mar, who continues voting, who, excuse me, who considers voting a personal matter and private matter. Carlinhos, her other son, hates Bolsonaro, but is non-confrontational by disposition, and perhaps more than anyone in the family short of his grandmother, prioritizes the maintenance of social harmony over arguing political positions with friends and family. And he too has become weary of the growing rancor. With these background anxieties manifest at Luzimar's party then, Carlinhos' speech that I began this vignette with was as much a call or plea for family as it was a celebration of it. The final part. So with the narratives of the Pereira family at the center, my book will move through five major themes. 
probably each of which will get its own chapter. I'm still thinking about that. Here are the themes. Intergenerational differences, often articulated by older family members as a breakdown in respect among young people, concerns about moral disintegration and the destabilizing of traditional gender and sexuality norms, the role of the military in society and the military dictatorship notwithstanding, the possibility that a greater military presence could restore order in Brazilian society. Next, ways of remembering or imagining political regimes of recent decades, including the period when the PT ran the show during more or less the first decade of the 21st century, but also including the, the ways that the military uh, dictatorship from the 60s, 70s, and 80s is remembered as well. And finally, uh, online social media, such as Facebook and WhatsApp, which have massively reshaped modes of communication among families and have troubled conventional understandings of public and private social spheres. I have a provisional title for this book. Uh, I'm not wedded to it. Um, we'll see what happens. It's Precarious Mobilities, Brazil's New Middle Class in Times of Crisis. Now, I'm aware that, that this list of themes for the chapters is a very wide thematic spread, and that any one of these themes could take up an entire book. So it's important that the arguments and conceptual priorities be clear. I think that the book is, in the end, about the meanings of family and the tensions that become manifest in a moment of deep political and economic crisis following a period of massive poverty reduction and, of course, the rise of social media. I argue that the possibility of a shared vision of family has been contaminated by the blurring of lines between public and private experience brought on by online social media. In the anxious, interactive flux of election time, excuse me, election season disputes, family for the Pereiras has become what I have provisionally referred to as a strange public. My book will be a reflexive account, uh, acknowledging and sometimes reflecting on my own positionality in and influence on the context I describe. I'm just going to end uh, with a, a couple of quick uncertainties and ideas, things I'm thinking about and would welcome uh, feedback uh, on as well. Certainly, there are a lot of ethical uncertainties about writing a book about a family that I love, uh, that I'm still actively in touch with. I haven't seen them in a couple of years in person, but I communicate regularly. Uh, on WhatsApp and other social media. Um, and what are the ethics of, of, of writing such a book? I have their blessing to write a book about them. Um, uh, I use pseudonyms for the, the family and the neighborhood. But this will be a very personal book. And I will, in some ways, be, uh, you know, be sharing um, some very personal stories of this family. So I'm thinking a lot about the ethical dimensions to that. Um, uh, Elena, when she gave me her blessing to write the book, uh, the qualification was to say, I know, Benjamin, that you will never bring dishonor or disrespect uh, to my family. So I have to think about that. Another thing I'm thinking about is the actual genre, the literary genre of writing that I want to use uh, for this book. Um, <clears throat> so one possibility I'm considering, uh, I mean, it's only me. It's not a collaborative book. It doesn't involve my co-principal investigators. However, I am considering the possibility of maybe inviting a couple of members of the family to have a look at draft pieces, draft chapters or sections of chapters, and respond to them. For example, the grandson, Everton, uh, I would love to know what he thinks. Uh, I should qualify that and say I would love to know, and I'm also intimidated and nervous to know what the family might think about the book that I'm writing about them. Um, something I'm thinking about. Uh, another thing um, is this question of, is this, a, is this a book about all poor and working class Brazilian families? In a sense, it, it is. Those of you in the audience you know, uh, who are familiar with Brazil, maybe you identify with a lot of the, uh, the happenings that I've described, or maybe even here in the United States you identify with a lot of this. Um, 
So in, there is something general, generally applicable about the story of the Pereiras. On the other hand, I know that the once rising poor in Brazil is not a homogeneous group and has a lot of variation depending on the city and the location and the neighborhood. Um, and I want to maintain that specificity. So I'm thinking about that as well. Finally, um, uh, a lot has happened since I finished uh, the data collection for this project. Bolsonaro's presidency, for example, and of course the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and I'm thinking about the extent to which I want to um, admit those into my analysis and my writing. I'm very excited to forge ahead with what will be my most ambitious writing project so far. It'll be great to get your questions, suggestions, and critiques today. Thank you so much. Wow, uh, Ben, there's uh, too many things to talk about. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything you want to start off by adding before we jump into questions? Uh, now that you've sort of rewatched that video, or do you want to jump right in? I say let's jump right in. Okay. Looks like a nice uh, New Mexico background you've got there. Um, so uh, folks who are watching, I know there are a number of people here. Um, please, again, as I said earlier, um, please put any questions you have into the Q&A field and we will get to them right now. We only have about four questions so that we should be able to get to everybody, which is great. Ben, the first question um, is from an anonymous attendee. Do you have any suggestions from your research to remedy the political divisiveness you found? Mm, um, that's a powerful question. Um, first, because it makes me uh, reflect on, you know, what, and I am thinking a lot about this lately, what, what is the audience that I want my book to be directed towards? And am I, you know, is this, is this primarily for kind of a Brazilianist academic audience? Is this trying to help people think about, because I think many of us have experienced some of the frictions that I've described for the Pereiras in our own families or with people we know or with our students or colleagues. Um, so is there something that could be, you know, could be uh, uh, applied. Um, so I should say, I'm not trying, I mean, I, I'm, I'm friends in that complicated way that anthropologists are both friends and strangers with the with their informants and the people that they study. Uh, you know, um, Michael Agar famously referred to us as, uh, I think it was Michael Agar, professional strangers. Forgive me if I'm getting that uh, reference wrong. Uh, he was the one who taught me the expression in any case. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have complicated relationships as do I with the Pereiras, um, but I'm not trying to fix the divisiveness in that family. Um, uh, I wouldn't deign to intervene on that level and I don't have the answer. Um, and I also, you know, I'm, I, as I said at uh, the beginning uh, of the presentation, I'm, I'm figuring out, I'm not trying to explain Bolsonaro's election. Uh, and although I hope that by understanding the conditions in which all of these frictions of the Pereira family and other families like them that I will also, by the way, be bringing into the, the book. I, I hope that by describing and bringing to light anthropologically uh, those conditions, those cultural, political, geographic, you know, uh, conditions um, in which all of this happened, that there will be some kind of, you know, it will generate some insight that will be useful. But no, I'm not trying to remedy, remedy the friction within the Pereira family. You know, it's interesting. I appreciated at the beginning you you talked about, uh, you said that you take exception, I mean, that's not the phrase you use, but you, you resist the, the reference to Bolsonaro as the Trump of the South. And I, I, I absolutely appreciate that. On the other hand, uh, I think your work it's like this particular family, in some ways, it's a micro history of a global moment, right? 
it, these are dynamics that exist beyond Brazil. The, the dynamics of a rising middle class thrown into precarity and in, 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 torn between perhaps it's, it's traditional politics and a new kind of politics uh, uh, with, a, with these kind of charismatic or demagogic figures, uh, th 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 that's a global, that clearly is a phenomenon beyond Brazil. So how, I don't know to what extent you, you want to wrestle with that, but it does seem to me your work speaks beyond Brazil, uh, Ben, mm -hmm. honestly. And I think it, 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 it if, I, if I could give you any advice about framing the book, it would be embrace that. Uh, yeah. not, not to go beyond yourself as an ethnographer, we always look at these micro settings, but man, does that, the, 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 the material you presented in this talk is just beautiful. It, it speaks to me as an American, a North American, who's got a, a family that maybe is similar in, in a lot of ways to the Pereiras. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of quick responses. I know there are other, other things to talk about. Well, one is I'm, I, I can see a lot of uh, friends and colleagues um, who are participating today, and some of you all I know well, and we're already in touch. And I'm really, um, you know, I know we, we, we may or may not dialogue today, but I know that I'm in dialogue with you. So um, that that makes me happy. It's so great to see familiar faces. Some of you I'm a little out of touch with, so it's lovely to see you here. So um, yeah, so Paul, this, uh, so two quick responses to what you said. First of all, those of you who know my writing and are anthropologists, you know I have a, I have a tendency to kind of veer towards the micro and in some ways, and frankly, to veer towards uh, descriptive ethnography. Uh, I'm very invested in evoking the kind of, you know, the lived experiences of these of people like the Pereiras in all of the messiness and contradictions and kind of chaos of, of, of that. Um, and I have a a, a mini diatribe that maybe some of you have heard me give about, you know, I, I try not to, I don't feel like I have to jump into a macro explanatory mode too readily. Um, but I recognize that I'm actually better at the former than the latter. And I do want this book to be an opportunity, not just to tell the story of the Pereiras, but to make the kinds of connections that you're referring to. So I actually, you know, this will be my second only the second, um, you know, ethnographic monograph that I'm writing, and it's a chance for me to do what you're what you're speaking of um, to make these broader connections. I just, um, I think many of many of us are aware, um, Paul. Not that you were going this route, but there is a tendency, at least in some social science circles, to sort of reduce. The Brazilian experience to just another, you know, Philippines, Turkey, uh, you know, US, and they're all kind of copies of Trump with slight variations. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the kind of narrative that I'm really just trying to stay far away from. I'm a Brazilianist, you know, at heart. That's, I want to, I want to shed light above all on uh, the Brazilian reality, but you're absolutely right that there is a connection to global processes, and um, I need to take that seriously. We, I, I'm, I'm feeling self-indulgent, but and we should move on. We have more questions coming in, but just one thing there. I get that we, you know, you don't want to reduce everything through a U.S. lens. Absolutely. However, perhaps this is uh, what your work gives us an opportunity for is to is to get beyond the provincialism of everything being about Trump and about the US. So in other words, the comparison going the other way. Anyway, you and I can, I I'll look forward to chatting with you more, but let's, let me pick up the next couple of questions. Uh, the couple of questions here that I think you can answer quickly. Um, are all of the family in frequent communication with each other? Uh, yes, and I see also, you know, another question from Amy about does the family spend time talking about politics with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm because I haven't been in Brazil in uh, about two years for all the obvious reasons. I stay in touch with the family, but not not the way I was. Um, and uh, so my sense of these things is more about 
when I was there, 2018, uh, 2019, um, before. Um, and in that context, yes, the, this family, despite all of the tensions, and I've really only presented like this to scratch the surface of all those tensions in, in this presentation. There, there's a lot more that has to do with religion, generational differences, um, you know, um, et cetera, some other, some other things. So there's an evangelical member of the family that that difference creates some tensions and whatnot. Anyway, uh, and yet, so the tensions are real and I think they're, they're not superficial. They really have challenged, um, you know, how family members think about each other. In fact, some of you may have read a piece I did in the Journal of Latin American Caribbean Anthropology that came out about a year ago that ends with the grandson saying to me on the day of the elections, these elections have forever changed the way I, I think about people close to me. So that's a powerful statement. They have uh, radically changed uh, this family dynamic. I've, I'm playing these days with this idea of calling it, it's, they, it has estranged, it's made it into their family into a strange public. I'm not sure I'm gonna stay with that concept, we'll see. Uh, and yet they still go to the little country house, they still, are always, if there's a birthday, everyone is gonna be there. And in part that's because Elena, the matriarch is kind of directing people to do that. She's very invested in full family participation, um, like at the, that birthday party. It's hard to convey how tense it was, that the vibe was at that birthday party. And yet everyone was there and singing and eating and celebrating. So it's. Maybe that's a paradox. Maybe some of you who are Latin Americanists, or if you're familiar with Brazil, you would say that's not a paradox. That's that's the way they do it. Um, but but I do think that there is something. There was a a real schism that has happened in the past few years that feels new and um, and important to make sense of for me. It's a related question here, actually perfectly related, which was that we jumped over. Did you find that there was a political divide based on sexuality? In other words, the, the, the sexual divisions uh, mapped out the political ones. Excuse me. Yeah, um, I think many of us are, many of folks here know this work as well as, or, or better than I do, uh, in Brazil and beyond, and actually it's starting to happen here in the United States. Uh, it's, uh, or it has been happening in different ways in the US. Sexuality and gender, kind of panic, if you want to use that term, um, keep surfacing in the context of elections around the world, but especially in Brazil, Latin America, and now it's, it's happening here. Um, and uh, so that is very, you know, gen those of us who know, you know, the Brazilian reality, gender ideology, and the, the gay kit, and all of that, uh, all of that stuff that seemed sort of ludicrous and ridiculous uh, to progressive intellectuals like myself and many of us here um, are real and are actually like grabbing people and getting them worried. Elena has, the, the matriarch has come to me and shown me images of drag queens in Brazil at gay pride festivals dressed up as Jesus and said, oh my God, is this what is this what's gonna happen to our society? Is this what the PT did to us that now this is possible. And that's a complicated conversation to have. So uh, anyway, so the, the short answer is yes, there is lots of political divide based on sexuality. I don't think it's really sexuality in a literal objective sense of like who people desire. Um, it's, it's sexuality as a, a stand in for a lot of other um, uh, at least imagined breakdowns in the moral fabric of society. Okay, great. Um, we're getting more and more questions, so I'm getting nervous. We, I hope we can go a little over, actually, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, please. Some great questions coming up here. Uh, here's a question from Chelsea West Ohori. At, Hi, Ben. This is Chelsea. Great presentation, and I cannot wait to read this book once it's done. I know we can discuss this further later, but I did have a question about genre and form, which you brought up at the end. I would love to hear more about how you engage such genres as creative nonfiction, for example, and more of your thoughts about the ethnographer as writer. So excited about your project and book. 
Right. So uh, thanks so much, Chelsea, for that. Um, it's exactly what I'm thinking about this week. Um, I, I've been in dialogue with a, a few of you uh, this week, um, so you know more or less what I'm going to say. I've been reading, who, who? I mean, who could have imagined? I'm, I'm back to reading Oscar Lewis, uh, you know, the, for better or for worse, the sort of, you know, the, 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 the quintessential, like, write an ethnography of a family, and it and of a working class family and conditions of economic political crisis, and you're telling the story of the nation somehow. Um, and I'm not trying to do it in any in, in such a productive way. I'm not obviously embracing Lewis's problematic ideas about the culture of poverty, uh, but I am thinking about like what is I'm thinking hard about what does it mean to to focus on one family, how much. Uh, do I want to try and privilege their voices on, on their terms? That sounds good to me. It, it resonates with my political sensibilities, but that's not a, not a simple thing. Uh, it's not, you know, those of you who do ethnography, ethnographic writing, it's not easy to commit to share your work with the people you're writing about. I do think that most ethnographic writing is actually kind of selfish, meaning I, I want to maintain my own voice, but I also, I really am thinking a lot about how, for example, I could ask the grandson Everton to write a couple of pages or something like that. I could even ask the oldest son, uh, I could interview him if he doesn't want to write it, uh, the, the military sergeant. I'm sure he has a really complicated reaction to the kinds of arguments that I've, I've, I've been having. I, there's a lot more I could say on that, Chelsea, and you and I will talk more and I'm, you know, it's an ongoing set of thoughts. There's a question from Sean Mitchell, and I, uh, you can read the preamble, but I'll just get right to the question. Um, I like how the narrative is centered on the Pereira family. Also, you point out that once the rising, rising poor are not a homogenous group, but are there aspects of the Pereira, Pereira family life you see as exemplary of the general experiences of once rising poor families? during this complicated historical period? If so, can you offer at this stage some more generalized reflections about that general experience among this population and how the experiences of the Pereira family help you understand it? Yeah, um, thanks uh, Sean for the, the question. Um, I, I think in some ways, John, I'm going to dodge it right now because I, I am. This is the question that I'm sort of sitting with a lot these days. Um, and the way that I will, uh, I mean, there are different ways to approach your question. One of them is kind of, you know, as, as kind of in terms of epistemology, what is the kind of knowledge that I want to create with my book? Is it is it a generalizing kind of knowledge that it that is that I'm going to argue is about a broader kind of demographic sector that we know, of course, Sean knows as well as I is, is very uh, heterogeneous. Um, is that what I'm trying to do to somehow kind of build a, a, some, a, a series of claims about this broader group based on not only this one family, let's, cause I'm also planning to bring in, you know, I have a whole ethnographic data set of other families, a couple dozen other families from the same neighborhood uh, that I am planning to bring in. Some of them are actually social contacts of the Pereiras. Some of them are not at all, but they are similar families in the same neighborhood. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a, you know, one way of thinking about your question in terms of what kind of knowledge do I want to create? And honestly, I don't have a, a, a real clear uh, response yet. I'm still, I have the luxury of sitting with this for a little bit longer. Um, now, in thinking in a more kind of objective sense, um, the Pereiras are, you know, among our sample, and possibly this would even apply to the Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro samples, but I'm not making claims there now, the Pereira families have a little bit of a better, a less precarious economic situation than other once rising poor families in the Mohodosi neighborhood. And I have to be careful about that. Again, I don't want to pitch them as like they're the exact sort of poster 
image of, of Brazil's new middle class or once rising poor. It's one of the great challenges of our work, Sean and, and Charles as well, and my book project is to somehow figure a way through that um, because there's so much discursive pressure in our work to reduce what we're doing at, uh, to a portrait of the new middle class, which sounds like we're talking about a, a real population that has shared values and characteristics and consumption practices and all of that. And I think we are, we, Sean Charles and myself and our colleagues who work on, on this in Brazil, we're all pretty ambivalent about what about how much unity there is within this, the people who have been lumped under uh, this category. So that's a circuitous response, um, but um, thanks for the question. Uh, here's a, a great question from Corey Kratz. Uh, ben, do you think you will write the different chapters from a single perspective or forward different family members' positions in some sections? You already sort of talked about that, thinking about that. In addition to asking them to read and comment on some parts, maybe they could read and then have a discussion among themselves and with you about it. Uh, I love the idea. Um, I am, you know, I'm just the last couple of days, I, I read, you know, the whole, uh, here it is, Oscar Lewis, sorry, it's not coming through, but it's Oscar, Oscar Lewis's uh, The Children of Sanchez, uh, which basically moves, you know, the way it organizes it, uh, the way he does it is, uh, first person voice chapters that are from different family members, the father and the children and all that. And I don't think I can do that. Um, uh, I think that the, the, many of the substantive chapters are gonna be thematically organized, um, written in my voice, but I'm very interested in the idea. And I don't know if it'd be like a chapter, cause I, you know, th there's, there is one person in the family who is actually, you know, an act, would not be intimidated by a, an invitation to contribute a text to an academic book, uh, but most everyone else would be. But there are other there. There's middle ground, and as I said, the grandson, I could literally, you know, I could interview him, or I could ask him to write something, or as you're suggesting, I love the idea of somehow having them discuss it without me being there and sharing what they want to share with me to the extent that they're comfortable with it. Um, the nice thing is I have tenure, so I don't need this book for promotion. Um, and it actually is, that is liberating. I don't say that like crassly. Um, I have the, you know, if I want to try a kind of, by my training, unconventional mode of, of writing and representation that somehow tries to bring in other voices, but still, you know, lists me as the author, I can, and I, I want to. Um, and I don't have a lot of experience in this. So you, I'm sure you're perceiving this. So many of you, uh, Corey included, have been giving me suggestions that I'm working my way through nice examples of, of contemporary ethnography in, of families uh, that integrate the voices of those families and represent them in different ways. So um, thank, thanks for that, that question and that comment. Um, okay, great. I'm going to jump ahead to a question from Duff Morton. Um, ben, your fascinating presentation makes me wonder if you might help us all think through the difference between class and kinship as modes of affiliation. One of Gilberto Freire's insights, I think, is that Brazilian families are often constructed as cross-class spaces, often with extreme inequalities inside of them. Dane Borges has talked to me about how Brazilian families are often also are also often the sites of class projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wonder if you could address that, the difference between class and kinship as modes of affiliation. Sure. Um, so uh, Duff, thanks so much for that. I, I'm going to respond. I'm also taking, I mean, you've, you've given me some really good things to think about too. So thank you for that. I also just want to mention, I know uh, we sort of skipped over the previous comment, um, but I, I do want to acknowledge that someone brought up the, the quote 
uh, quote unquote, larger story of regionalism in Brazil. And uh, I, that, thank you for putting that on, on here. I, I, you know, it's something that Sean and Charles and I, my, my, my colleagues on our larger project, we have to grapple with, um, we still have to, um, because there, you know, region is everything in Brazil. It's some, something we forget sometimes. Um, it's so important. Uh, on, both in terms of identity and resources and kind of political power and all that kind of stuff, development. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that comment and say somehow I have to address, address region in my book, although it will be focused on one region. It's not a comparative study, uh, so, although the work that I do with Charles and Sean is comparative and there are several uh, publications that are um, more quantitative and kind of positivistic that are in progress or are coming out um, as well. All right, uh, Duff, your um, thoughts. So I'm going to take an easy path, uh, an easy way through, easy response. And, excuse me, Ben, there's also a second part to Duff's question oh, I had okay. not seen. So just let me read that second part. Sorry sure. to do it. throw you a curveball here, but Many thinkers have told us how family can transmit class, i.e. you get class from your relatives, mm -hmm. but maybe family can also sustain or even increase or produce class distinctions. So that's, that's what Duff's trying to get at mm -hmm. here. Yes. Uh, let me say that that comment uh, makes me think of a couple different things. First of all, it's, problem, it's problematic no one called me out on this, but you could call me out on using any class terminology to describe the whole family. Because I told you uh, that I gave you some a little bit of information about the per capita income of the family, but there's a range in there. The oldest son makes a lot more than the youngest son. Uh, and if we were only talking about the oldest son's uh, salary, he's an army a sergeant in the, in the military, uh, he would probably be classified by demographers as middle, middle class. And the, the poorest uh, child of, of Elena uh, would be classified as poor, not lower middle class. So um, I, I know this, I think Duff's question is more kind of coming from a sort of Bourdieu class distinction uh, perspective, but I did want to just acknowledge that any characterization of an a, a working class Brazilian family with a singular class label should be immediately suspect, and that includes the Pereiras. And I, I haven't addressed that in my in my um, in my presentation, so just want to acknowledge that um, class distinction. Oh yes, um, and it's good that you mentioned. Um, uh, the work that you, the historical work that you I, uh, that you mentioned, um, Borges, because I have not looked at that in a while. And yeah, there's a good discussion about that. And I do think that yeah, there is a kind of a, a complicated way. Heck, this could be a you know something I really take on explicitly in the book um, about moments of class or assertions of class distinction and friction in terms of taste and in the Bourdieu kind of sense of class in daily life family interactions, like at that birthday party. Um, uh, and they, this would involve things like cell phones and who's listening to what music and who's watching TV versus who's getting their news from, you know, Facebook. Um, those are all are they generational? Are they family tensions? Are they class distinction assertions? That would be really good for me to look at. So I'm, I'm, I thank you for making me think about that, and I will uh, think about it more. I'm not going to talk about Gilberto Freire, although that's very relevant because he is from the city uh, uh, or is associated with the city where I. To have done my field work, um, simply because that would take me 10 minutes to really give a substantive response to that. But thank you, Duff, and please let's continue talking about this. We have two questions from, um, from Moises Copper. Um, and here's the first. Uh, what's the scope of your analysis of the Pereira family and in 
in what ways will it speak of the broader political, economic, and subjective issues millions of Brazilians experience during the time of your research? Are they a kind of ideal type for a specific mode of subjectivity? What exactly is being elucidated about the affects and political subjectivities of Brazilians through the experiences you portray with the Perriera, Perrieras? Keep pronouncing that in Spanish, and I know I shouldn't. I know my Portuguese is terrible. Um, do you want me to jump, continue with his second part of his question, or do sure, you want to take that? Second part, uh, your project is wonderful in how it seamlessly transitions across online and offline dimensions and individual familial and national issues. How can storytelling, you mentioned the literary genre, and the subjective implications of the ethnographer help create the link of scales that will allow you to tell a story about the Perrieras as much as a story about Brazil's pivotal moment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so uh, also I haven't mentioned it, but um, Moises, who also has been to the SAR, SAR campus, by the way, he was part of our research team seminar, uh, as was uh, Sean Mitchell um, uh, uh, three years ago. Anyway, uh, Moises, uh, my very respected colleague um, and interlocutor, uh, I didn't really give him the acknowledgement um, for something important, which is to the best of my knowledge, he's the first person to uh, use the term once rising poor in English. Uh, so he gets a, a footnote for that. Um, uh, yeah, so the second, Moises, the second comment you made, I'm not gonna really give a detail. You know, how can storytelling and the subjective implication of the ethnographer create the link of scales that will allow me to tell a story about the Pereiras as much as a story about Brazil's pivotal moment. I don't know, but I that's exactly what I'm thinking about and what I'm working out. Um, I, I um, part of it, you know, I am a empiricist at heart, like that's where I come from. So there is a kind of an empirical answer to that question, which is, I don't only have data on the Pereira, Pereiras, I have data on dozens of other neighborhood, uh, dozens of other families in the same neighborhood and individuals. So I can actually do some kind of variables based, variables based social science, comparative social science. Um, that's not the primary kind of sensibility of this book, but I, I intend to do it. I intend to be able to weigh you know, does does Elena, as a as an older woman, she's now in her late sixties. Uh, well, how does she compare with other older women in the neighborhood who are widows and who have base roughly the same socioeconomic kind of conditions? Um, so part of it is an empirical question that I'll be able to do it. But you're asking about storytelling, and that is the big question that I'm I'm thinking about right now. Um, this uh, you know this week and next and for the next couple of weeks. Now, um, uh, okay, yeah, and I guess that does all connect to your first question too. Are, are the Pereiras a kind of ideal type for a specific mode of subjectivity? Um, I'll say that I'm still figuring out how deep, I, how, how, how much I want to use the concept of affect uh, in this uh, analysis. Um, I'm still somewhat new to it, although I've already used it a bit in the last few years. I like that it it, it gives me something that post-structuralist, you know, the post-structuralist kind of subjectivation theory that I was trained in in grad school never gave me, which is the kind of embodied feelings that are transmitted among communities and bodies associated with politi political sensibilities. There's, there's something I love, I find it very seductive, the idea in affect theory that, you know, ways of feeling and citizen subjectivities can kind of are sticky, they move between bodies. And um, so I find that very seductive. I probably want to use it in some ways, but I also have some reservations about it. Um, I So far, I don't think I want to argue that the Pereiras are like an using a sort of ideal type. And in that sense, I think I'm going to diverge from Oscar Lewis, because that's exactly what he did, I think, as I understand his work. Um, I think I'm looking to show um, kind of key, let's say, nodes, if you will, or points of friction, maybe could be a useful way to thinking about it, that have to do with online social media, what happens to families when they start 
debating and interacting with each other in totally new unrestrained ways in like the family WhatsApp group, what happens there, what happens to family, what happens to their political sensibilities, what happens to their sort of love and affection for each other. That's a kind of a node where I think I can make some uh, generalizable claims that hopefully will be meaningful for readers. Um, there are issues just about cultural memory uh, about how people are, are um, you know, talking about and thinking about the dictatorship years. In this family, Elena is the only person old enough to have any living memory of those years, I mean, really. Um, and yet everyone talks about it and kind of debates it. And my aim is not to like show the ideal type uh, or kind of, you know, one primary variation, but to map out the different kind of points in, in this, or the, let's say the different variations that I think are, rep, are manifest in the stories of the, uh, of the Pereiras. And this has to do, I, I'll, I'll keep this short. There, you know, as I said, when I mapped out the, the, the chapter themes, you know, there's gonna be one on religion and how evangelical Christianity kind of feeds into this. Um, that's very relevant in the family, although I haven't talked about it a lot. Um, concerns about gender sexuality and um, the way people talk about the militarization of society, which could be a good thing. It could, it could bring more order back into Brazilian society, depending on your perspective, or it could be uh, ridiculous and, and uh, retrograde. Um, yeah, that's a, a light response to a really uh, heavy and excellent question. So thanks for the question. Uh, ben, we have uh, one more question, um, and I think you'll. You, I think we're seeing a pattern with a, a lot of these questions. Um, this is from Bronwyn Poole. I appreciate the sensitivity of sharing the personal story of this family, but it seems like you have the opportunity to show how this family's experience is a microcosm of the experience of families around the world as politics and social media impact personal lives. I look forward to discussing more such amazing research uh, you can draw on. Yeah, so I mean, of course, that's similar, Paul, to what you said when you referred yeah. to what I'm doing as the micro history of a global moment. Um, so, you know, I know we're, we're winding down here, uh, but I'll just say, you know, I. I going back to my early self kind of critique, which is that I, I still, you know, I need to push myself to make broader claims of that, that extend at higher scale, different scales or different levels um, than the people that I'm doing ethnography of. Um, so in, in line with that, I, I haven't even mentioned, you know, there, there are much bigger theoretical questions here. Um, that I know my, my colleague Sean Mitchell and I have talked a lot about, you know, is online social media, is that good for democracy? You know, is, is the fact that every single family in Latin America and much of the rest of the world, just not the United States, but in, certainly in Latin America, has a devoted private family WhatsApp group. Is that good for democracy? Is that, on the one hand, it seems like it is. It's getting people sharing information and maybe the grandmother who was never interested in politics now sh you're sharing some links with her so it, it's good for it's good for democracy right where we, we we tend to think that you know democracy gets stronger when people talk and share information and debate and deliberate well that is very much up for debate um and certainly the brazilian case and just the story the pereiras brings all of that um up for interrogation so there are some really big uh, questions. There's also the question of middle classness. You know, um, is it, you know, is is the expansion of Brazil's lower middle class in just crude demographic terms? Should that has that been good for Brazilian democracy? And in Brazilian studies, those of you who, many of you are Brazilianists, we already know that it's in 2021 to argue that you know poverty reduction under the, during the PT years and under Lula and Dilma, strengthened and consolidated Brazilian democracy is a very problematic claim. And many of us are considering if maybe some of the seeds for this mess uh, that Brazil is in right now, um, 
that some of this has to do with aspects of the poverty reduction initiatives undertaken during uh, the PT years that some have argued are more that it's they it spawned a generation of consumer citizens who don't have much class consciousness who don't have much interest in the left you know they, they don't feel much gratitude to, to the left um, and they've kind of disengaged from politics so those are I mentioned these as we're winding down because there are really major political science sociological global globalization questions that my work speaks to I just I, I tend to kind of do the the ethnography of the descriptive piece, uh, the micro history before I get to the global moment, but clearly the two are connected to each other. For sure. Um, well, that seems like a great, I, I, I would love to keep talking and hopefully you'll stop by and, and we can chat uh, some more, but uh, I think we should call it a day at that. And thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, I hope we did get to all of them at this point, I think so. Um, and uh, we will post this talk online on our YouTube channel uh, within the next couple of days as soon as we can get it all uh, uploaded. So look for that if you wanted to share it with others as well. Um, ben, I think I should sign off at this point. Um, and folks, thank you again. I appreciate everyone's attendance and questions and interaction. And I, it was a wonderful presentation, lots of food for thought. Thank you, everyone, and thank check you. out SAR's calendar for our next colloquia presentation.